is Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Okay. I know I've met a lot of you here before. I'm a paranormal investigator, researcher, and author of approximately 60 books on everything paranormal, metaphysical, and mysterious. Angels to zombies and everything in between. Over the course of my life, I have looked into the light side and the dark side. I have experimented with a lot of divination devices, including the Ouija board which inspired me to do this book called Ouija Gone Wild, which came out a couple of years ago about the freaky history of the Ouija board. I'm often mystified why I run into so many people who are terrified of this device, even though they may have never used it. Um, people often think that it is demonic, maybe to demonic possession, that if you are even in the same room with it sometimes, bad things are going to happen to you. And yet I've used one off and on all of my life with rarely a negative experience. So today's uh, program is going to look at the pros and cons of Ouija. Is it really sane and safe, or is it demonic and dangerous? And actually, there's really no clear-cut answer on this question, because the Ouija board has a very bizarre, even twisted history. And we're going to get into that today, and also how to use the board if you are so inclined to, to use the board. We will take a look at some of the myths about the Ouija, and whether or not they have any foundation in truth, or whether they have been fabricated and then taken hold in popular culture. And I see I need to get a little focus here. This cartoon says it's like testing, it's like texting, but for dead people. <laughs> <laughs> That's my book, Ouija Gone Wild. I'm in booth 821 uh, all weekend, end of commercial. Uh, this book has uh, a lot of stories in it that uh, my co-author, Rick Fisher, and I we spent several years digging through newspaper clippings, magazine articles, documenting real experiences over the 100-year-plus history of the Ouija board, and interviewing a lot of people for original stories in the book. Some of them really are quite hair-raising. So what is it about the Ouija board that polarizes people so much? We're either drawn to it like a moth to flame, or we are totally repulsed by it, want to steer clear of it, get away from it. It has this aura of mystery to it that many people cannot put their finger on. And in paranormal investigation, I do a lot of investigations, uh, I run into these polarized feelings all the time. It's generally not a good idea to take a Ouija board on an investigation, but not because of the board, because people freak out around the board. And uh, so it's the people who often wind up being the problems. People use the Ouija board in pairs. People use the Ouija board by themselves. Three or four people can work the board. And it's an interface between us and the spirit realm. It functions like a lot of tools. It is intended to open doorways to uh, establish communication with somebody or something out there who's willing to answer our questions, spelling them out in a very tedious way, letter by letter, sort of like the old spiritualist days. But this is what people often feel is going to happen when you use the Ouija board. It is going to usher in some sort of horrific spirit that will attach to you the environment and mayhem will ensue. Is that true? Well, let's take a look. First, we have to look at the origins of the Ouija board. Where did this device come from? And guess what? I think we can blame it on Ohio. <laughs> the board was actually manufactured in Maryland, but they got the idea from Ohio. And why is that? Well, back in the mid-1800s, Ohio was an absolute hotbed of spiritualism. There were seances, all kinds of devices were being experimented with, and one of the most famous places was right in Athens. It was called the Kuhn Spirit Room. The Jonathan Kuhn's family got direction from spirit. They became interested in spiritualism, went to some seances, and were directed by the spirits to set up their own cabin to contact the spirits. And uh, they used all kinds of devices. Uh, some of them were kind of um, invented on the spot by the spirits. 
A famous one was the spirit trumpet. Spiritualists used these. Uh, these were devices that uh, sometimes were said to float in the air and amplify very weak spirit voices. Mm -hmm. Mediums would put the, the narrow end at the base of their throat, and so the spirit voice that was speaking through the medium would amplify out into the room. Uh, Coons found that if you left pieces of paper on a table, the spirits would draw things, like this supposed diagram of the celestial realm. Now, the Coons spirit room attracted people from far and wide to witness these spirit demonstrations. And when you sat in this little 12 by 16 cabin, uh, all kinds of noise and racket would go on with the spirits banging and singing and thumping. Well, it was stuff like that that was actually the precursor of the Ouija board. One of the devices that they used, and which became very popular all across uh, the land and across the Atlantic, where uh, spiritualist activities were taking place was something called the planchette, a totally revolutionary device, a little wooden platform on wheels with a pencil in it, and uh, you could put your hands on it, ask the spirit questions, and then the board would wheel around on its own and literally write out answers longhand. Here's uh, an actual one. You can see the little wheels here, and that's where the pencil went. A few of these are still around, and they're highly prized by collectors. Various experiments were done. Here's one blindfolded. All kinds of tests were done on mediums to try and determine whether or not spirits were really talking through these devices. This was probably the, the biggest precursor of the talking board that became the Ouija. Another device that was employed throughout Ohio and the rest of the spiritualist land was the dialing wheel. And here we have uh, letters of the alphabet and numbers on a board that tilts. It's almost like a roulette wheel, uh, where you spin the, uh, the dial and allow spirits to select the number or letter to spell things out. These devices were quite pricey at the time, and so um, inventions were made to kind of bridge the planchette to the, uh, the dial. And here's one that uses a little, like, a uh, flat wagon on wheels with letters and numbers on the side, and you put your hands on it and slide it back and forth. Uh, this would be probably one of the earliest pre precursors of the talking board. That's the generic name for Ouija. Uh, a little platform on very tall legs, and you uh, wheel it over a board that has letters and numbers on it. Well, all of this going on here in Ohio, captured the fancy of a man in Baltimore, Maryland, named Charles W. Kennard. And Kennard was a businessman. He'd been in the toy manufacturing business. And he thought that there must be a way to capture these devices into a commercial device that could be marketed and mass to the people. A very shrewd man. And uh, so what he was looking at was combining the planchette and the dial plate. Because by the 1880s, these were all the rage everywhere. And this is when Kennard started to get interested in it. Now, he was especially intrigued when he saw a newspaper article from Ohio in 1886, which got played in the New York uh, market and in Baltimore and major newspapers around the country, where some politician here in this state uh, described the Ouija board and condemned it as the devil's board. Not because it was evil but because people were so fascinated by all of these spirit-talking devices that they were neglecting their jobs, their families. They were so obsessed that it surely was the work of the devil <coughs> to obsess all these people. So what Carr did was he took the elements of the planchette and the dial plate and put them on a board and started trotting it around to parties of his friends to see how well they liked it. And it really took off. So in, in 1890, he founded a new company just to market this device and filed for a patent. And of course, everyone wants to know where the name Ouija came from. Well, that has an interesting story, too. Now, Elijah Bond was a friend of his who was a patent attorney. And there were uh, a handful of men involved in this original company. This company had so many convolutions, ins and outs, and changes. I could spend the, the rest of the hour talking just about that. So the shorthand of it is, from the very beginning, there was a lot of tumult in getting the uh, Ouija board out into market with people coming and going. 
uh, in the company. Here's Elijah. And now Elijah had uh, a connection to Helen Peters Nosworthy, um, who was a, a, a relative and uh, also with Kennard. And uh, she was a young woman with highly mediumistic ability, but she had never really developed it. And um, she's really the one who gave the Ouija board its name and secured the patent for it. It's often been said that uh, Ouija must be a combination of the French and German words for yes, we and ya, we ya or Ouija. Uh, actually, from the beginning, the preferred pronunciation was Ouija, and there was even a patent for that term as well, W-E-E-J-A, Ouija, uh, to protect the sound of the name. But the actual origin of the name came from a locket that Helen was wearing. Nobody knew what to call the board, so they had a session to ask the board, what do you want to be called? And Helen was participating in that, and the board spelled out the word Ouija. Now at the time, she was wearing a locket which had an image of a woman on it, and underneath was the word Ouija. Nobody knows if that was the name, a personal name, or some other kind of name. Nobody knows what it signifies. But the question remains, did the board name itself or was there some sort of subconscious influence because of what Helen was wearing herself? Well, they had a great deal of difficulty securing the patent because the folks down in Washington, D.C. didn't think that this device had any merit. Talk to spirits, right. Well, if you can prove to me that that's what this device really does, said the patent officer, then I will give you your patent. So Helen and uh, Elijah and uh, Charles, they go down to Washington to actually do a demonstration of the Ouija board to show that it does what they claim it could do. And Helen sat at the board. The officer looked at her and said, uh, she did not know his name. She said, if that thing can spell out my name, you've got your patent. The board spelled out his name. He turned white as a sheet, said, you've got your patent, and took off. <laughs> so, as of 1891, the Ouija board was in business. And the early boards were wooden, uh, quite thick, in fact, different designs were made. And then, Less than a year later, along comes another personality who really made the Ouija what it is today, and that was William Fold. Now, he had started with Kennard's company as a painter and varnisher, but he was very shrewd, very smart, and within a year, he had elevated himself to the position of manager to run the whole company. And it wasn't very long before all the permutations and changes and convolutions going on within the, the partners who were coming and going out of this company, that uh, by 1919, he had control of the entire company, set up his own company, the William Fold Manufacturing Company, and obtained the rights to patent for the Ouija board. So that's why William Fold's name still appears on the Ouija board today, because this is the guy who really put the Ouija board on the international map. Now, these boards were hugely popular from the beginning, but an organized marketing effort to sell this to the public still hadn't taken place until this guy came on the scene. William Fold loved to convey that there was a mystique to the board and that it was, it was very mysterious and that even the spirits had uh, something to do with its um, invention. Uh, he was also a very um, good man, businessman, and eliminating the competition. When uh, his own brother broke away from the company and set up a competing company, Fold smashed it. In fact, if any competitor started to get an edge with a board that looked like the Ouija board, they were in for a lot of trouble because Fold wanted the whole market for himself. Uh, so a lot of people just uh, were very attracted to this device. It was entertaining. You could be your own medium. You didn't have to go sit in a seance and be a medium. Endless hours of entertainment at home. It was considered to be a fun, harmless device. And in fact, the Saturday even, Evening Post even portrayed it that way in 1920 with the Norman Rockwell cover. Here's a, a courting couple. Uh, and they're playing with a Ouija board uh, for an afternoon or evening's entertainment at home. All good and fun. Different designs of board. Uh, this is from an exhibit that was in Baltimore a couple of years ago. Um, and the planchettes that go with them. 
Fold even brought out uh, different kinds of boards to, this again was to try and keep the competitors at bay, Swami boards, Hindu boards, um, you know, mystic boards from um, foreign land sort of thing. Some of those are high in price. Here's one of the competitors that didn't make it, the mystic finger. Doesn't that sound kind of strange? <laughs> and uh, used kind of a little round device here. But a lot of these were very short-lived, and in fact, if you can lay hands on one of these in the collector's market, some of these uh, short-lived competitors actually are quite valuable. Uh, the electric Ouija, that came out in the 1930s, and it actually lit up with lights. But it was so expensive relative to the plain boards that uh, nobody could afford it, because the, the unfortunate timing of this was the depression had just started. And so these boards didn't last very long either. Now, this is one of the current modern ones, came out a number of years ago, the glow-in-the-dark Ouija. Um, I have a very modest collection of Ouija boards. I've only got about a dozen or so. My co-author, uh, Rick Fisher, has about 50 boards. And uh, one of our friends, Robert Murch, who's one of the leading historians on the whole history of how the Ouija board came to be, he's got hundreds of Ouija boards, an amazing collection. Uh, and so it does intrigue a lot of people. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Now, many of the opponents of the Ouija board are very critical of the fact that it is sold as a toy in a game, as though this is some nefarious plan of Satan to corrupt children. There is a reason why this is so, and the answer is the IRS. It has nothing to do with any great evil plan. In 1920, another company called the Baltimore Talking Board Company that had licensed the right to make Ouija boards uh, was uh, challenged by the IRS, who said that um, the, I the IRS's position was, this device is a toy and game, and it is a taxable item. They claimed that it was a religious spirit, spiritual device, and therefore exempt from taxes. Uh, they took their court, the uh, game company took their case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court refused to hear the case, the IRS won, and that is why the Ouija board is officially a game and a toy today. Now, the Ouija board does have a very strange history. If this is truly a benign device, and actually a tool, any sort of spirit communication tool is, is neutral. It's a device. How do you use it and how the personalities use it, that's often what makes the difference in terms of the results you get. But nonetheless, People using the Ouija board have had a very strange history, um, and it's involved in murder, crime, money issues, inheritances, marriages, divorces. People have done all sorts of strange things because the spirits told them to on the Ouija board. A few examples. Well, here back uh, from the 1930s, we have a couple of detectives who uh, are consulting the Ouija board to look for a missing person. And whether or not they're doing this sort of tongue-in-cheek, uh, Rick and I actually found a fair number of articles, especially from the early 20th century, where the Ouija board was often consulted for missing things, including people. And sometimes it found them, and sometimes it didn't. Here's a case where uh, police were using a Ouija board to search for a missing girl in a particular town. She wasn't found in that town, but she was found in a nearby town. So did the board help? Well, maybe it did. Uh, we all know uh, about how people have channeled in various ways, and in the early uh, 20th century, a woman named Pearl Curran used a Ouija board to write uh, huge volumes uh, from an entity who identified itself as Patience Worth, a woman from the um, 1600s. If any of you have ever tried to read the Patience Worth novels, it's like reading Chaucer. They're very hard to get through. But she used a Ouija board, and it just got spelled out uh, letter by letter. And later she switched to some other techniques. But um, uh, there are many examples, even into modern times, of how artists have at least started with the Ouija board to get some sort of inspirational thing going. Well, let's get into the really good stuff, like the murder and the crime. Uh, and we found so many examples of really bizarre murders. Here's a case in Buffalo, New York, 1930. Adultery, hexes, and murder. Now, this case involved um, an artist, a sculptor. Uh, and uh, he and his wife were in their 50s. And one of his models who posed for him fell in love with him. So they started an affair. 
and uh, she was very jealous of the wife. So she also had a relationship with another woman uh, who uh, she was giving Ouija board consultations to. This woman had lost her husband. She was deep in grief. And uh, she, the model started getting these ideas for how could they get rid of the wife of the sculptor, sculptor so that she could have him all to herself. So she told the grieving woman that her husband had been hexed by uh, the wife, and that uh, this was all revealed through the Ouija board, how uh, she had used witchcraft to kill the husband, and uh, that the uh, Ouija board, the spirits on the Ouija board, and her dead husband were urging her now for revenge. Mm -hmm. She must kill the wife, and that's exactly what she did. She mm -hmm. murdered the wife of the sculptor. It uh, looked like the perfect crime for the model because this other woman was going to get blamed for the crime and she would be out of it, but the whole thing fell apart. Um, it was exposed, they were put on trial, but they got off pretty easily with just very light jail time sentences. Mm -hmm. A gullible woman who believes the messages from the Ouija board. And also this command to kill. And we found this over and over again. Spirit saying, you must go out and kill someone. And people would say, okay, I'll go out and do it. Uh, here's a horrible case from the 1930s Arizona, Daddy Must Die. And uh, again, sex, adultery, infidelity, those sorts of things. Couple moves to Arizona, wife falls in love with a cowboy, decides she'd like to get rid of her husband. She and her 15-year-old daughter use the Ouija board. And the Ouija board tells them that daddy must die. And furthermore, the daughter <coughs> should do it, the 15-year-old daughter. So this child evidently was so much under the control of her mother that she agreed to do it. One day when the mother was out, she got a shotgun, went up behind her father in the barn, quailed at the last moment, couldn't bring herself to pull the trigger, then got resolved and shot him in the back. She didn't kill him. He was taken to the hospital where she said that she had tripped uh, and the gun went off and she accidentally shot him. He lived a, a short time and then died of his injuries. That crime also uh, was exposed as well. Um, the, the mother who thought she was going to be able to go off with a cowboy, it was an accident, nobody's going to uh, suffer for this. But the daughter confessed. She was overcome with guilt and she confessed what had happened with the Ouija board. So the mother and the daughter were both put on trial. And uh, interestingly, they served light sentences as well. <laughs> the daughter actually just spent uh, a little bit of time in a convent. Uh, Ouija band, after wild rituals, money burning, nudity, and kidnapping. That's exactly the kind of story we want with the Ouija board. And it just confirms everything, right? Uh, and this happened in the 1920s in uh, El Cerrito, California. Uh, and again, people are attempting to contact the dead, a woman attempting to contact her dead husband, and all sorts of spirits start communicating on the Ouija board, instructing them to do things. Um, and uh, they're supposed to have these uh, rituals and take off their clothes uh, while they're doing the rituals so the spirits can speak more honestly. Um, one of, a, a group forms, and they all start getting obsessed by the Ouija board, and one of them is told that um, uh, money should be burned for the spirits, and they're out throwing dollar bills and money into the fire. Uh, then they're instructed to kidnap a young woman who lives in the neighborhood, so they kidnap her and hold her hostage in the house. And uh, finally, the police are called. Uh, this actually went on for some time, and it sort of built up in uh, a crescendo of activity, alarming all the neighbors. And uh, three of the women were um, sent to, to a trial and judged to be Insane. And in fact, we have a number of cases where uh, people seem to have literally gone off the sanity edge after becoming obsessed with, uh, with the Ouija board. A uh, very disturbing case in the 1990s in England where a man was uh, charged with a double, brutal double murder of a husband and wife. And uh, the evidence was uh, fairly good against him, but not conclusive. That uh, he desperately needed some money. He knew the man kept a lot of money at home, and so he broke in and uh, wound up not getting very much money, uh, but savagely murdering the man and his wife. Well, while the jury was out deliberating one night, 
they decided to get a Ouija board out and ask the Ouija board if he was guilty or innocent. And the Ouija board said guilty. So they come back with a guilty verdict. Um, this got leaked to the press, and you can imagine what happened. So the whole trial was thrown out of court. The guy gets a new trial, and he winds up being convicted because of the evidence. But uh, what's going through the jurors' heads to use a Ouija board to say, is somebody guilty of murder? Kill seven to avoid eternal torture from California. Uh, from the late 1920s or early 1930s, this is a 65-year-old woman who becomes obsessed with the Ouija board and uh, starts getting these messages that in order to avoid eternal torture in the afterlife, she has to go out and kill seven people. Go figure. How do you figure that murder is going to save you from hell and damnation? But uh, she was, uh, her, her uh, husband died under mysterious circumstances, a son died under mysterious circumstances, and uh, she was finally caught and charged with the murder of yet another son. Um, so that's her testimony. The Ouija board made me do it. Wife must shoot. This is, this is a murder, but this is just another crazy example of how people have used the Ouija board. A husband and wife uh, have a Ouija board, and the husband is now it's the husband who's getting totally obsessed with the Ouija board. So he tells his wife, well, she has to make a choice. We can either have sex at night, or you can talk to my dead father on the Ouija board. What do you think she's going to do? Well, she chooses the Ouija board. <laughs> and she doesn't know really how to talk to her dead father-in-law, so she fakes it. She just fakes a bunch of messages. And um, then uh, she sues him uh, for divorce, uh, charging extreme mental cruelty because he made her do this. Uh, another very bizarre case. She was 24. Ouija declares infidelity, a case from 1923. Uh, and we have many examples of this, where people who have suspected their spouses of infidelity consult the Ouija board to find out if it's so. And if the Ouija board says, yes, it's so, uh, then they do extreme things, like murder. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, a woman suspected her husband of infidelity. She asked the Ouija board. The Ouija board said yes. She shoots him to death. And then she's charged with murder. And that's her defense. The Ouija board said he was unfaithful. Jail time. Uh, there was another uh, case where uh, a woman was convinced that her husband was having an affair. It turned out he wasn't. But she was suspicious that he was. So she and her daughter, her adult daughter, are working the board. And uh, the board is telling them that uh, this guy is being unfaithful. So they tie him up in the basement and torture him with electrical prods. Wow. And uh, he breaks free and escapes. They catch him, bring him back to the basement, tie him up and start torturing him again. He breaks free and in a rage, he kills the wife. So he's now charged with murder. <laughs> Well, uh, all this bizarre testimony comes out, and uh, he did get off because of the circumstances, uh, that it was justifiable. Um, but uh, here again, we have people who become totally obsessed, uh, just like this case, and do strange things. Uh, many cases of the Ouija board telling people where to find fortune, uh, where to dig for gold, where to find uh, rich veins of, of ore, and uh, here's a case where uh, a young man was uh, communicating with the Ouija board and told him where he could find gold by digging for it. Uh, he goes out and digs for it. There's, uh, he actually digs quite deep. And uh, there is a cave-in in the pit, and he is killed. Uh, a lot of people have tried to use Ouija testimonies in court as evidence. And uh, here's a man who was playing with the Ouija board, and the Ouija board tells him that his neighbor has an illegal gun. So he brings a charge up against this man, and it all goes to court. And the only evidence against this guy for having a gun is the Ouija board said so, in case they're on the court. Uh, not all things are, are negative. Here's a case where uh, two women uh, using a Ouija board were warned of an intruder in the house, and it turned out there was a man, actually a neighbor, in the house at the time. And uh, they took the warning seriously, and when they discovered where he was hiding, he, uh, he was spooked and he fled. 
money losses all the time because of the Ouija. Woman uses the Ouija board religiously, and one day it tells her, you are about to suffer a great loss. Two gypsies come to the door, and uh, you know they're running a money scam. So through their artful questioning, they uh, learn that she has $850 in the house. So they uh, tell her that she is under some great curse, and they will lift this curse, um, and they're happy to do it for her. So they tell her to get her money, and they get two two pillowcases. So put the money in one pillowcase, give them the other pillowcase, and she's supposed to sleep on the pillowcase with the money in it, and they'll do magic and uh, take away this curse. Well, sleight of hand, they switch the pillowcases. She puts the pillowcase uh, uh, on her bed, sleeps on it, opens it up in the morning, no money. Yeah, you're about to suffer a great loss. And she did. The Ouija was accurate. People were always writing into Dear Abby about the Ouija. And uh, here's a case where uh, a concerned relative said, said that uh, uh, a widow is being taken for a ride by a financial advisor who says that her dead son is communicating to him on a Ouija board and directing how she should invest the money. And as uh, Abby says, Ouija board out, it spells F-R-A-U-D. And finally, uh, Princess Grace Kelly loved the Ouija board and uh, often played with it with her celebrity friends. And they would use the Ouija board for placing bets on racing horses. Uh, it doesn't say in this article whether or not they actually uh, won anything, but uh, it was a favorite activity of hers. <clears throat> well, what accounts for all of this? We asked our good friend Catherine Ramsland, who's a, uh, an expert in criminal psychology and forensics and criminal profiling. What is it that makes people obey anonymous messages over any kind of spirit device, but especially the Ouija board? And uh, uh, she said that the board becomes so attractive as a definitive interpreter of events of the future because the person often lacks the ability or knowledge to accept that the world is an ambiguous place where many questions will never be answered and justice will often fail. Certain personalities cannot deal with this truth and the Ouija frames a world that feels safer, better, and more controlled. Some of these people are then easily persuaded to obey whatever they think the forces want them to do. These commands typically, typically arise from the person's internal conflicts, rages, jealousies, and delusions. So in other words, these individuals seem to be incapable of solving their own problems, and so uh, they project something onto a device like the Ouija board very readily that sort of gives them permission to do extreme things that they would really like to do, but they need some sort of prodding to do, some sort of permission. And that seems to be what goes on in a lot of these cases. Meanwhile, moving on, uh, I want to get into uh, film and fiction here. The Ouija board had a device as a prop in a lot of shows. This is from the Waltons. Uh, you know, this is like American family stuff, you know, really solid values. And here's a Ouija board on one of the episodes. Uh, and nobody thought that the Ouija board was anything dangerous. It was just a, a game, a toy that a lot of people use for entertainment. So uh, we often see it as a prop in many TV shows. Uh, and even uh, into fairly recent movies, Here's Only You with Marissa Tomei and Robert Downey Jr., uh, where she's 11 years old and a Ouija board spells out the name of her lover. And then much later on in, in life, the man she's destined to be with, much later on in life she goes uh, in search of him. And it turns out to be Robert Downey Jr. And uh, the Ouija board, so the Ouija board plays the role in the beginning, but it's the the happy device for how she connects with the, the man of her dreams. However, most of us think of a much more sinister side of the Ouija board, and we have been heavily influenced by Hollywood, who from the 1960s on have seen the Ouija board as a wonderful device to propel horror movies and horrible things happening to people. It looks spooky, it's a spirit device, uh, once the door is open, any, any sort of thing can be put into a movie. You can make the board fly around, a catch on fire, uh, all sorts of um, things to scare the audience. And uh, I, I'm just going to showcase several films 
that were pivotal in influencing mass opinion on this. 1960, the original 13 Ghosts, it was remade some years ago and uh, with a much different plot. But in 13 Ghosts, a family moves into a haunted house and they find these special glasses that enable them to see ghosts. <coughs> special effects of the day. And uh, they also start playing around with the Ouija board. And the Ouija board suddenly takes a sinister turn when it spells out the word, words hurt and kill. And from then on, uh, it seems that the ghosts in the house are really evil entities. And they start, uh, you know, the usual cycle of murder, mayhem, and uh, a terror that we often find in uh, Hollywood movies. So the Ouija board then becomes the intermediary between this horrific world and the natural happy world of the family. <laughs> the Exorcist. One minutes and 45 seconds. That's how long the Ouija board scene lasted. And it became perm permanently cemented in everybody's head that Ouija boards lead to, to possession. Um, and uh, this bait was based on a real case from the late 1940s involving a young boy um, and uh, it's never really been clear in the real case whether the boy actually played with the Ouija board that much. He had an aunt who was interested in the occult and spiritualism. Uh, Ouija boards were very common toys at the time, so it's possible he could have used it, but is it the agent that led to his possession? Nobody really knows for certain. In fact, there are even uh, people who debate a lot as to uh, whether or not he was actually uh, fully possessed. Uh, but the uh, book that came out, William Peter Blatty's book, you read about the case in the paper, the movie that came out, William Friedkin's movie in 73, um, I think that The Exorcist still ranks as one of the creepiest uh, horror movies of all time. Uh, it evokes an atmosphere that um, makes you feel very vulnerable. And in fact, this movie sent many people to ministers and psychologists because they were now afraid that something was out there that could lead to their possession. So in the movie, the central figure is uh, a girl, Reagan. And uh, she's a normal, happy girl, but she turns into this over the course of time. And it, uh, uh, the, the uh, movie implies that the doorway for this actually demonstrates the doorway is the Ouija board. She finds a Ouija board in a closet, starts playing with it, contacts an entity who identifies himself as Captain Howdy, who's nice and jolly and friendly, and uh, what's behind Captain Howdy? A horrible demon. So um, in this one minute and 45 uh, segment um, in the entire movie, uh, here's Reagan's mother, she uh, finds the Ouija board, she says, oh, what's this? Where, where'd you get this from? Oh, I found it in a closet. Well, what do you do with it? I talked to Captain Howdy. Uh, who's Captain Howdy? Oh, I don't know, you know, he's a nice guy. And uh, so she sets the board down and works it, but Captain Howdy doesn't want to talk to Mom. Uh, so Mom shrugs it off, and, uh, you know, the next thing you know, uh, they're under attack by uh, an ancient uh, entity, a very violent entity by the name of Pazuzu. And uh, the movie really is quite chilling, the way this takeover uh, progresses. And uh, they summon uh, spiritual help, uh, <coughs> the priest, and exorcisms are performed. Uh, people often got the impression from the, uh, from the exorcist film that all exorcisms are like this, with levitating people, uh, objects being uh, thrown all about the room, uh, all kinds of um, danger and damage. And actually, they are quite dangerous to do and exorcists do put themselves at risk for it. But movies always embellish things, of course. So, uh, my gosh, kid played with a Ouija board, now look at her. Uh, and, uh, you know, really dramatic scenes like this. Um, and it is true that possessed people are impervious to pain and they will do things to, to hurt themselves. And the, the movie illustrates that quite uh, in quite stark ways. Uh, the famous head turning scene, yeah. where the head turns completely around 360 degrees and she does bad things to herself with the crucifix. Um, the spider walk that was actually taken out of the original film but was restored in a director's cut where she spider walks down the stairs. And finally, Pazuzu is exercised after a very horrific experience. <coughs> the movie shook up a lot of people 
and it really damaged the reputation of the Ouija board. But the movie that really sank the Ouija board ship as um, a, an evil device was Witchboard in 1986. It combined every single uh, folklore and misunderstanding of the Ouija board into one single movie. One, uh, the Ouija board is a doorway to hell. Um, you will automatically contact evil entities when you use it. And if you use it alone, you are really in trouble. And uh, so a group of young people uh, start using this Ouija board and they contact a spirit named David. And uh, uh, David starts out as um, a seemingly nice guy. And here you see a Ouija board with, this is what happens. <laughs> people start getting killed because it's like the entity now starts emerging into the environment and offing all of the people who are involved in this uh, Ouija enclave. So it's a reign of terror and it's like this entity was just waiting for someone to use the Ouija board so that it could, could come out and do all of these horrific things. Uh, several witch boards followed on that one. Paranormal activity. Um, I was not a real fan of paranormal activity. I thought it was boring, actually. Um, but um, a couple moves into a house, they have uh, phenomena, they set up surveillance cameras, and you sit around and wait for a few things to happen. But there is a scene uh, where the husband sets up a Ouija board and uh, goes away and leaves the camera running, and then the Ouija board bursts into flames. And so people think that this, this is what happens to the board, too. Uh, and in the, here's the, their bedroom surveillance, something would uh, come in, they would leave flour and chalk on the floor and get horrible footprints. And uh, the movie did have a good kicker for an end, I have to admit that. Um, oh dear. something that doesn't like you and wants to cuss and um, there are uh, entities, um, I think I've gotten um, gin on the Ouija board and uh, they do identify themselves. Okay. Nothing like technology. Um, and a lot of times they just want to play games. So uh, when that happens, and uh, I have contacted an entity named Zozo on the board, there we are, uh, not because I wanted to talk to Zozo, but so just decided to show up. And uh, when that happens to me, and an entity wants to play games, then uh, I shut the session down, uh, because I don't think it's productive. But this is where a lot of people make mistakes. They keep it going because they're intrigued by it. And in fact, there is a movie called I Am Zozo, and uh, this is based on a real story of a man named Darren Evans who um, became obsessed with the Ouija board and an entity who identified itself as Zozo started coming through and then really impacting his life. Poltergeist phenomena in the house, health issues, mental problems that affected his family. Uh, what happens in a lot of these cases is that the, uh, the entity starts out being very nice and then over the course of time becomes uh, more and more uh, threatening and, and negative. And uh, in the right personality mix, some people can have trouble shaking this kind of spirit oppression. It becomes almost a form of possession. So this is based on the true story. And in fact, uh, I have run into a host of Z entities. They go by Z, Zil, uh, Zaza, Zozo. And I think that they're all kind of um, split personalities of, of the same entity, Zozo. Um, I asked John Zappas what he thought Zozo was. Is it a demon or what? He said, well, it acts demonic. I'm not really sure. There are lots of trickster entities that we would consider demons <coughs> or jinn that would do this sort of thing. And the thing about the Ouija board is that
that uh, it's, it's a device that's readily available to a lot of people. And so it's a good uh, to for people to be wide open and want some kind of adventure and then something negative comes up. Okay, this one, um, boy, the fundamentalists got all upset about this. Um, actually, it, it has no connection, legal or whatsoever, with Barbie. But because it's pink and uh, purple, uh, it was made it's especially for little girls to take to their slumber parties. Oh, now, the progression of the Ouija board is that uh, it got sold by the Fold Company, it got sold to um, Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers, and Parker Brothers got absorbed into Hasbro, it's now owned by Hasbro. And uh, so this was a Hasbro uh, and cute little pink carrying case. Well, all of a sudden, uh, very fundamentalist parents were objecting to this about how uh, Hasbro and Luigi were attempting to corrupt our young children with a demonic spirit device. The publicity was so bad that stores like Walmart, Toys R Us, <coughs> scurried around pulling these things off the shelf, which then became prized by collectors who were oh, scurrying yeah. around trying to get them. And uh, I do have uh, what's called the Barbie Ouija. I have one of those. Um, it's been the position of the manufacturers of the Ouija, at least from the mid 20th century on, not to comment on any publicity pro or con about the Ouija board. And it's, I, I can't speak for them, but I can say that that's probably a very wise thing to do because it's, it doesn't matter whether the Ouija board is lambasted or not, uh, the publicity always drives sales up. So here's one of the ads, you know, look mom, can I have uh, a pink Ouija board? Can I play with my friends and their friends? <laughs> I don't use Ouija boards anymore, I've switched to Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, where are we now? Well, uh, Ouija has, uh, it's, anyone can make a, a talking board. What's patented, uh, Ouija, the mystifying oracle, the specific way that the board is laid out, but anybody can you know, legally make a talking board uh, of their own design, and uh, just dozens and dozens of um, well, different kinds. This is Metallica's version of the Ouija. Kirk Hammett made this famous. He has a number of Ouija guitars. He uh, commissioned them particularly for him. And whether or not the spirits played through him, I guess we'd all have to uh, wonder about that. Uh, you can even clean your breath with Ouija mints. Ouija mints. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot of people like Ouija tattoos. <laughs> Uh, this is a friend of mine. I can't imagine the pain he went through to get that. All right, uh, coming up to the uh, last part of the program here. Can you use the Ouija board worry free? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the Ouija board really is a neutral device. It does have a very problematic history, but uh, in case after case, we can see how it's the people who have really colored how events have, have uh, occurred as a result of using the board. If they've been using automatic writing or the pendulum or something else, some of these people may have arrived at the same course of action. The Ouija board is just readily available. So uh, what I recommend to people, uh, I like to collect used boards, but objects do retain energy. Uh, and if you are all concerned about having a Ouija board that might have been used for the wrong purpose, uh, it's a good idea to get a new one. And uh, the people should always use it when they're feeling good, not tired. Many of us have different levels of boundaries uh, to the spirit world, and uh, some of us are more susceptible to those spirit links. So it's a good idea to always be in the best of shape and uh, to invoke your spiritual protection around you. This, the, uh, uh, this is advice that applies to any kind of spirit communication session, regardless of the device you're using. Now, a lot of people will start with a board like uh, anyone out there, uh, which may not be the best tactic. It's a good idea to always focus your, your spirit communication to a specific purpose. And uh, many people start out wanting to, to contact their loved ones or to ask uh, specific questions. Foolish questions. People are always tempted to say, uh, when will I die? And if they get an answer back, uh, then it sets up a terrible uh, anxiety in them because they become deeply uh, worried uh, and fearful that that actually is going to come to pass. And I have had to deal with people 
who are petrified that they are going to die in the next day or so because the Ouija board told them that would be the case. Discernment, common sense, and always stay in control. You're always in control. The spirits aren't in control. The board is not in control. Many people don't end the session properly. Uh, any kind of spirit communication session should be closed. The session is now closed. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, whoever has communicated with us, uh, you stay on your side and in your realm, and we are in ours. The door now is shut. Some people like to cleanse the space after using a Ouija board. Um, I generally don't do this myself. Um, I do daily meditation and uh, all sorts of environmental cleansing things on an ongoing basis. But it doesn't hurt if you have any lingering worries at all just to use a little incense or saging uh, and uh, invoke uh, white light from your spiritual helpers. This is also where a lot of people run into trouble. After any kind of spirit communication session, uh, we have a tendency, and if it's been scary or exciting, a tendency to think about it, keep running it through the head, talk about it. Uh, spirits do have the capability of following your thoughts. They will track your thoughts and emotions. And what I do after any, any investigation, no matter what I've encountered, is uh, I shut down my mental doors. I don't think about it, I don't talk about it. I have to eventually, because I'm a researcher and a writer, and I have to look at it and put it all together. But when the energy is high, I just turn it off and I do something else for a while. <coughs> Ouija turns 125 in 2015. There's going to be a big conference in Baltimore. I will be there. And uh, if you go, you could go to another cemetery in town and see the new tombstone that has been put over Elijah Bond's gravesite, the man who patented Luigi. And that was erected courtesy of Bob Murch, the historian that I mentioned. So we've got uh, a few minutes if anyone has any more questions. Yes, right here. Is the board effective if you're trying to contact somebody specifically, and if so, how do you go about targeting? Is, is the board effective if you want to contact someone specifically, and how do you go about it? Well, actually, I, I consider the board kind of clunky because it spells things out letter by letter, although the pointer can zip around very fast. But in any, any sort of directed communication, I, uh, I would open the doorway, and I, I usually open it by uh, saying, you know, this is Rosemary Allen Guiley. Um, I'm uh, here on uh, November uh, 22nd. And uh, at, at whatever location I'm at, and we are using a device called the Ouija board. We would like to communicate with, and then state the name. And uh, if if that person is present, can you respond? Uh, and uh, sometimes nothing happens for a while. Sometimes something happens right away. Uh, there are lots of drop-ins who will crowd in if if you do get any reaction at all. That. Uh, there are plenty of entities who do like to masquerade and joke. And, um, so it's it's not the best kind of device for that sort of communication, but it can work. Anything else? Yes. Do you consider items such as the uh, ghost box, spirit box, or even with the um, things like uh, audio work when we use our digital recorders and paranormal investigations, do they fall sort of along the same lines as a Ouija board because it does open up communication in the manner where any spirit can come through? Do ghost box, ghost boxes and other kinds of high-tech devices and EVP sorts of devices, are these in the same category? Technically, yes. In fact, the ghost box, of uh, which at one time I had seven of them, I, mm -hmm. have, I now have uh, three, um, has been called the electronic Ouija board okay. because it does the same thing. And the ghost box uses... Uh, a scan of AM fan radio to set up a jumble of noise that seems to be conducive to real-time two-way communication it is quite effective. And um, uh, we'll have to close now, so this will be the last question. It is quite effective, uh, and they do open up uh, very significant portals, and the same kinds of entities can come through. So, okay. same precautions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.